Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The book of Ephesians will start out establishing to the believer your position in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what does that mean to be saved? What does that mean to be in Christ? That's an expression that's used over and over again throughout the New Testament, particularly by the Apostle Paul, to be in Christ. What does that mean? What does that afford me? What does that mean in my relationships with other people? But the first thing that I'm given here is an understanding of who I was before Christ. Before Christ, I'm described as having been what? Dead in my trespasses and sins. When I was a junior high boy and I came to an understanding and my faith went into the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, something happened. The biblical term that is used in verse 1 is that I was quickened. I was given life. I was given creation. There was a new creation that God made when I was saved, when I became what we would describe in the Scripture, even a, a child of God. I likened it this morning in the 9 o'clock service. One of our children was born, and when this child was born, the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck, and he came out, and he was very purple, and he was obvious that he was struggling, and the doctor did a good job, and they worked to remove that umbilical cord, and they gave him a swat on the back so that he would let out that breath, you know, and draw it that in. And uh, boy, that life that came, and that noise that came, and he's been making noise ever since, right? <laughs> And I understand there's a difference here and that he was alive when he was conceived. I understand that. But in that moment there, as a parent standing there, I watched as that child seemingly began to live, so to speak, and took that breath. When you got saved, bam, well, something took place. Now, I didn't know that when I was a junior high boy and I heard the gospel. I didn't know what was happening in the courts of heaven or what was happening inside of me with my soul and that new birth. I was in the junior high at the time. It was a Sunday night. I got saved. The next day I went to school. I went to the same school that I'd always gone to. I saw the same people that I'd always seen, but there was something different about me. And it was something different that the Lord saw, and that was that I was now his child, that I was now a part of his family, that I had been dead in my trespasses and sins, unable to live for him, unable to fellowship with him as he wanted me to, and now I had been brought to life. I had been become a part of his family. Boy, you don't have to understand that to get saved. Aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't say, I need you to go through four years of training. I need you to memorize this, recite this, and answer these questions in order to be saved. Here's what you've got to know in order to be saved. You're a sinner. He's a Savior. Allow Him to save you, and by faith believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that He died, that He was buried, and that He rose again to make a payment for your sins and to give you eternal life. Well, I'm glad the Lord keeps it simple that way, aren't you? But then what the Lord wants to do is He wants to develop us. He wants to bring us through books like Ephesians to help us to understand who we were before and who we are now so that when we find out how he wants us to live for him, we know how to do that. We know who to do that through him, and that's his power in our life. And so this first verse introduces who we were. It describes how we lived our lives. Whether we understood that or not, we were living our lives walking by the course of this world. There's a stark difference today between the believer who has, was dead and is now alive and the person who is not in Christ. One is going to a totally different place. One has a totally different outlook, a totally different approach to living, or should have, and that's what Ephesians wants to shape for us, to have the right mind. I'm headed somewhere. I'm going somewhere that's being prepared for me. I'm at peace with my Creator. I'm alive. I'm living. The course of this world is that hedonistic philosophy of eat, drink, and be merry. Why? Because tomorrow you die. If all there is to this life is the course of this world, then you'd better live it up because it will never get any better than this. But for the child of God, I know who I am. I know the condemnation that I was under, and now that I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I have passed from death unto life. Now I have somebody, I have something, and I'm headed somewhere, and that is to change radically my view of things. 
And that's what the Scripture does for us. The Holy Spirit helps us. Romans deals with this about your mind being transformed, how you view things, how you view situations, how you logic through things, how you have understanding, how our treasures change. Those things that are valuable, if in this life I seek to gain all there is because that seems to be the course of this world, when I know that there's more to life than this, then I let those things go and I begin to live for things that are eternal. And this is the challenge, isn't it? It's kind of like when God brought Israel out of Egypt. He led them out by a man by the name of Moses, but then he spent all those years doing what? Getting Egypt out of them. The easy part was to get us out of Egypt. The complicated and challenging part, so to speak, is learning to live by the Word of God and allowing the Spirit of God to get Egypt out of us, the course of this world. The Corinthians struggled with this and had to rebu be rebuked on multiple situations because they were continuing to walk after the world. We're called to a higher calling, a higher purpose. Notice verse 8, but it's not my works, it's not what I would do that would save me, it's not me changing the course of my life. No, it's for by grace, verse 8, for by grace through what? Faith. I believed, and there was grace administered to me, unmerited favor, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Boy, that verse just blows it out of the water, doesn't it? That's just cl plain cut there. What is salvation? It's a gift. Who deserves it? I don't deserve it because of anything that I have done. Why? If salvation were earned, here's what we would do. We would boast. That's who we are. That's, that's, that's the, man, the humanity in us. We would boast. We would say, listen, I'm saved because I've done this, this, and this, and this. But the reality is this, I'm saved by His grace, His unmerited favor, because I believed in Him. And the reality is that you too can have that same experience. You too can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can be saved as well. And then it's not for me to say to you, I'm saved because I'm a part of this church, or I'm saved because I preach, or I'm saved because I sing, or I'm saved because I give, I'm saved because I've done this and I've done that, and you haven't. No, we all say the same thing. What? Man, by His grace. That's timeless. That transcends. That trans transcends cultures. That transcends generations. That transcends uh, uh, understanding, education. We're all in the same way. And that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great message? What a tremendous truth. Now notice this. Verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are, verse 10, His workmanship. Anything about me, anything that's good and right and decent, anything about us is God's workmanship. We are His workmanship created in Christ whom? Jesus. That word created there speaks of a new creation, right? That's that new creature thing. That's what the Lord did. The Lord did something fantastic when He saved you in Christ. New. Wow. Not retread. I went down to get some tires recently for the buses and they said, you got options. You can get a new tire, you can get a retread tire. And there's a difference in price. We recommend that you only run retreads here, this, this, and this, and this way and that way. I'm glad that I didn't get retread. I'm glad I got new. The bus tire, one thing. With me, I'm new. I'm a new creation. He didn't just clean me up and straighten me up. He made me new. That's the only way I could be created and be accepted by Him was to be a new creature in Christ. And we are, and I'm glad for that. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto, what's it say with me? Unto what? Good works. Hold on a second. Verse 9 said, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Lord wants to be real clear. Your salvation, you going from death to life, was not by works, because if it were by works, you would boast about it. You'd take all the glory from it. You'd get all the credit for it. You'd show up on Sunday, and I'd tell you how good I am, and I'd try to remind you of how bad you are. I might even act like I was good, so you would think that I was something. But listen, here's the deal. For by grace... Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It's His grace. All of grace is my story. All of grace from here to glory. And we can all sing it. We can all say it. That's why the missionary we had last week in Mexico, a missionary is going around the world that you see. They preach the same message. They point into the same Jesus. And we can collectively every Lord's Day stand up and say, hey, three cheers for Jesus because it's all about Him. By the way, that's what heaven's going to be. Heaven's not going to be about you. It's not going to be about me. It's going to be about the lamb that was slain. 
and we're going to sing hymns and songs to him, you better get used to being around God's people and talking about Jesus because you're going to be doing it for a while. As a matter of fact, a little bit, are you awake this morning? A little bit what church is. Every Sunday morning when we gather together and Sunday night, that's God's people coming out of this world, coming together to talk about Jesus, coming together to talk about His truth and His Word, to sing about Him and to rejoice in Him and to look forward to Him. That's why we're not supposed to make Sundays about the individual. We're supposed to make them about Jesus and living for Him and loving Him and knowing Him better. And so we see here in the book of Ephesians, we are His workmanship, so it's not by works. And yet he saved me to what? To works. Why didn't I, when I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, why didn't just all of a sudden I just take off to heaven? Why am I here? Why are you here? This is one of those deep questions, you know. People ponder that statue of that guy with the the thinker. Trying to figure it out, you know. What's it all about? The annihilist has an approach to it. The evolutionist has an approach. Why am I here? I know why I'm here. God made me. He made me to fellowship with him. Sin took me from him. The Lord Jesus redeemed me to him and gave me, made me a new creation in him. And now I'm here to live for him. Now I'm here to do something. Not to boast on myself, but to do the works that he has for me. I'm his workmanship. He's working. The Lord wants to work through your life. The, word wants, the Lord wants to use your life. You're here for good works. You say, well, the preacher's here for that. God's people are here for that. We are here for this. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now go with me, would you please? There's a couple of pictures that are used in the book of Ephesians, the first few chapters. One, it establishes the believer's individual position, and then it talks about the believer in light of the whole of believers and what that's to look like. And a description that is used here in the last verses of chapter 2 is that believers are a part of a building. This is not the only time in the Bible this is used this way. I believe it's the book of 1 Corinthians also. There's some direction that way about a building and the Apostle Paul being a builder and building people of, the God, people of God. And here in Ephesians it's used also. In Ephesians chapter 3 we're going to talk about believers being a part of a body. The eyeball and the ear and the hand and the various functions. But we're a building. And so if you would allow me just a little bit of liberty with that, I'd like to use that approach there to talk to you about that question that I mentioned to you a moment ago, and that is, what kind of block are you? What kind of block are you? I am saved by grace. I am his workmanship, and he desires to use my life for good works. We are likened to his believers collectively being a part of a building. Who is the foundation of the building? Jesus is. He's the chief cornerstone. He's that stone that was set. They would figure everything out. They'd get it all laid out, and then they would set a cornerstone. And that cornerstone, by that cornerstone, would all things be measured. All right? Well, when I started building buildings and I had not having just enough experience to be dangerous and not enough experience to be good, I just figured you start throwing boards together and stand it up and it all works out. It doesn't work out quite that way. And some fellows came along who said, Preacher, you need to use a level. A level, I thought two by fours were straight from the store, right? And those of you that aren't getting the humor, it's because you've never built a building. And those of you that are, you understand, right? And so you get those things out, and then you, you got to lay out the corner. You know, I just assumed if you put enough 10-foot boards together, you'd end up with a building that was ten, a room that was 10 by 10. You know, it doesn't quite work that way. you got to square it up. There's got to be a point, Right? And so out in the street on Sheik Road, when we built that first building, they went out and they drove in the ground a steel a nail, so to speak, that would become a fixed position that from that nail, all things on the property would be surveyed and would be set to and would help us to know where to build things. And then you would go and you would set that building up and you would find a corner and you would lay that first block. And from that first block, all things are drawn from that. Who is that block? Who is that chief cornerstone that all things are drawn from and built on? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the prophets taught. That's what the apostles taught. And that's what's been revealed to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the chief cornerstone. Hey, let me put this in there and then I'll move past it real quick. That means that if somebody does not have a biblical view of Jesus Christ, they do not have a biblical view of God. Let me break that down and put it on the bottom shelf. That means if you ain't right on Jesus, you ain't right on God. 
That means that no matter how popular it is and how pie in the sky it is to say everybody has their own faith and as long as we believe in the same God, we're all going to... No! That's not biblical. That's not what the Bible teaches. Now, they, they are free to believe what they want, but if you bring yourself to the authority of the Scripture and you say, I believe the Bible, then, friend, you've got to recognize there is only one way to God, there's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus Christ because He is God. Anything else is opposite. Anything else is blasphemous. Oftentimes, cults will draw you in by saying, we believe in the same God, but we're getting to Him a different way. We see Jesus as a, as a son, a real good son, or we see Jesus as a prophet. Are we, no, 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 no. Jesus is God. He had to be or he couldn't save you. And we get that. And so that's that important thing. He's the cornerstone. We build on that. That's why we should make it all about Jesus. More about Jesus, right? More of his love, more of his word, more of his truth. The others show, you know, the preaching of the cross, the preaching of Christ, the preaching of salvation by grace, it does something. It tears down barriers. There's not enmity. The Jew doesn't no longer says you can't be a part of this. The Gentile says we got our own thing. It's all knocked to the ground and we point them to Calvary and we say, hey, there's Calvary's mountain. There's where the lamb was slain. There's the empty tomb where the lamb rose. There he is seated at the right hand of the Father and all men, uh, he's not a respecter of persons, whether they be Jew or Gentile or Greek, circumcised or uncircumcised. All men can come to him and receive him and when we do, we're a part of that, that building. Well, you want to help the world? Preach the cross. You want to help the world? Preach Jesus. You want to make a difference? Give the gospel out. You want to make a difference? Tell them who Jesus is and what he'll do for them. And that is what brings us together, Christ and the cross. And now in that, where's this building? I have something here. You're familiar with these. I have to use this size. I'm not ready. I've not graduated to the smaller size yet. These are Legos. Legos can be used to build, and Legos can also be left out in the middle of a floor. And somebody walking through barefooted can step on one of these and catch the corner of a Lego and very quickly find out how the depth of their spirituality. <laughs> how many of you have ever stepped on a Lego in your bare feet? And what did you think? You did not say Lego my ego, did you? You said, Lego, let me find that person who left it out, and let me tell them don't ever do that again, right? Hey, a Lego can be used to build great things. A Lego can also become a tripping hazard. You know, a Lego can also be a choking hazard. Yeah. A Lego can also be a lot of fun to throw at people, too, but don't do that. It's a building block, right? Put together, you make something. Individually, say, remains that way. I'm not preaching on Legos today. But here's the deal on this. The Lord put us together, and He wants us to be built to build what He wants. And you're a foreordained to good works. What kind of block are you? Preacher, what do you mean? I'm glad you asked. I see three types of blocks in the Bible. I don't know that I'll be able to get to all of them. When I was a child, I, in school, I was told by my friends that I had a block head. Somebody said one time, point in the back of your head so flat and so big, we could show a movie on it. Here's what I would say to that. The screen is opening up, all right? The curtains, have, the curtains have parted, all right? You're going to be able to watch a lot on the back of that head. I've been called a blockhead before. Have you ever been called a blockhead before? You, you, whether you know it or not, I, we did call you that. Anyhow, what kind of building block are you? You know, the Bible talks about people being stumbling blocks. Now, before I launch into that, the word stumbling block is used throughout the Scripture. It's used in the book of Leviticus. Do you know the Lord is such a good God and such a gracious God that God... Even in the law that he gave to his people and organizing things for them as a culture. And I get it. People say, we're no longer under the law. That was for them. Okay, I get I understand what I'm not under. But I also see the wisdom of God in things. Did you know that your forefathers, they used the word of God in some of the very laws that God gave the children of Israel regarding how they were to govern themselves? They used some of those in principle and practice to establish some of your laws? It used to be a day when we put the Ten Commandments up, right? We'd post them. We'd say, hey, these are Ten Commandments from God here. These are good things. Right? Shake your head up and down. One of the things that the Lord told people that they weren't to do, Leviticus 19 and verse 14, thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God. I am the Lord. What's that verse all about? It's the Lord telling folks to be courteous and to be gracious to people who have needs. 
that were different than others. To be kind, to be helpful. You wouldn't put a stumbling block. You would go out of your way to not put something before a blind person. I don't know if I shared it in church or not, but I've shared this story with someone recently. There was a man in my home church who was a tremendous soul winner. He was blind. They walked with the tapping stick and everything, but this guy would go everywhere around the church and the area, and he would witness to people. And one day he was walking, and somebody had uncovered a manhole cover, and he fell right in it. He survived it, but it made for a tremendous testimony because that doesn't happen to everybody, right? And there he was, an uncovered thing. You know, a stumbling block is like a wet floor without a caution. A stumbling block is digging a hole and then not surrounding it with a barrier so that the unsuspecting person might come not paying attention and fall into that. A stumbling block is sometimes intentional. Matter of fact, the book of Revelation, there was a guy who was rebuked from the Old Testament. We'll not go into it. They, they used it as a picture in one of the churches to rebuke them because somebody taught somebody else how to be a stumbling block to others. You see, a stumbling block is an occasion to trip. It's an occasion to have your path interrupted. Did you know that the Lord himself even said that he would put a stumbling block in front of a righteous man if he turned from righteousness to iniquity, that he would set a stumbling block in front of him so that he too would trip and potentially stop what he's doing and look and see where he's at and recognize that the Lord was dealing with him. Stumbling block. In the book of Romans and also in the book of 1 Corinthians, it, there's a couple of passages that deal with the topic of Christian liberty. And inside the topic of Christian liberty, the Lord says that we're not to use our Christian liberty to become a stumbling block to other people. I see in our generation people who are using and abusing what they're allowed to do without consideration for the stumbling that it causes for others. May I say, first of all, as a society, some of the things that we engage in just because we are free and we have freedom to to publish and freedom to broadcast? Should we? Should we really have to tell people that it's inappropriate to have videos and pictures and images of somebody's daughter in a compromising situation? Should we really have to do that? Should I really have to say to music that's put out and produced that that music is offensive? Should I really have to say to the guy that Hey, man, take the bumper sticker off your car with the swearing words on because my children are in the back seat and they're learning to read and they're reading your bumper sticker. Would I have to travel through life with a little slit in my windshield for people to look at? Do I really? Is it really okay? Is it really? Is it, do we not see the problem with that? Do we not see the problem with, with films that depict murder and mayhem? Do we not see the problem? Are we that, like... I, I'm not a genius, but I can figure this thing out. If you put a little child and you give them a game and they, you give them a firearm in the game and you tell them to go through and shoot people, do we think that that's conducive to good living? Is that not a stumbling block? Well, we're allowed to do that. We have freedom to do that. But should we? Would we leave a, an open pit for a blind person to walk through? Would we put a stumbling block? Would we hand these things to our children? What are we doing? What kind of block are we? And we just look at the world and say, man, preacher, I agree. But you know, the believers also can be a stumbling block. One group can be a stumbling block to others. By our what? By our actions, what we do, what we say, by our attitudes, by our appetites, by false teaching. Did you know you can be a stumbling block? One can be a stumbling block to another in salvation and knowing salvation. The Lord rebuked in his generation people that misled folks and brought them into false understanding of truth. You and I need to be very humble, and you and I need to be very, very careful in proclaiming the word of the Lord. We need to be very cautious. So oftentimes we interject our opinions and our thoughts, and we need to stick to the script. We need to stick to God's word. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach? We don't want to be that stumbling block. You know, a stumbling block... The Bible says, let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. To my shame, as a teenager, I suspect that I was probably a stumbling block to others. I suspect that there were times where my attitude and my action was not pleasing to the Lord. But don't look at me like that. I think if we were all honest, we would look back at that and we would say, yeah, I could see that there probably was some things. 
There was a young man when I was a teenager. He was a few years behind me, and oh, how he looked up to me. Boy, he wanted to go places with me. He wanted to hang around me. He wanted to talk to me. He wanted to be my friend. He, he just, I had that influence. He didn't have an older brother, and he was probably looking for one. I never led him into sin. I never led him into immorality or anything like that. Don't let your mind run wild. But I was not as sincere and serious. And I remember there were times when he as a little guy would go to camp and he'd make a decision for the Lord. And he'd come back and he'd be excited about that. And at that time in my life, I was too cool. Some of you teenagers, you're too cool. You need to let up. You need to be sensitive to that. And I can't say I was always as excited about his decisions for the Lord as I should have been. And I don't know how much of a stumbling block I was, but I suspect there was some. And so when the Lord dealt with my heart and I yielded to the Lord and I said, man, I want to really do something for the Lord, I went to him. And you know what I got from him? What I had shown him and my response when he came to me about those things. I took his picture and I put it in my Bible. It's still in one of my Bibles in my office. I taped it in there, a high school picture, and I put it there as a reminder to me. I don't ever want to be a stumbling block. When somebody wants to grow in the Lord, when somebody wants to develop in the Lord, I don't want to hinder them or hurt them or keep them from doing that. There are things in my life, there are things about my life that I could do that I choose not to do because I don't want to be a stumbling block to another. There are times when I've apologized when I didn't have to apologize. There are times when I've clarified when I didn't have to clarify because I did not want to be a stumbling block to others. There are times when I've seeked to make amends with people. There are times when I've said, hey, whatever I need to do to make this right, if there's something I've wronged you in, if I, if I owe you, tell me what it is. You said it, and I want to do that because I do not want to be a stumbling block to keep you from going forward in the Lord. I, I don't want to have that reputation. I don't want to be that kind of block. I don't want my attitude, my appetites, my affections. I don't want to be what I have said or what I have put portrayed or what I have projected. I don't want that to hinder people. We are a cynical, critical generation. And there is so much around us that is negative, it's very easy to do, isn't it? We have, there have been problems, there have been situations, and if we're not careful, man, very quickly, we, we view everybody through the same lens. Everybody's a creep until they prove to us that they're not. And the issue with that, and that creates an environment where it's really difficult to help people and not become that stumbling block to them. Imagine the Apostle Paul when he showed up and people were afraid of him. Here's Paul, hey, this guy's got a reputation of persecuting people. Stay away from him. I'm not telling you we shouldn't use wisdom and discernment. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm suggesting that in this that we're a part of, we don't want to ever be that block that causes one to stumble. Well, if they don't like me, they can just get over it. God help us. They just didn't get it. They're immature. They're babes. They're this. They're that. Whoa. Don't be that stumbling block. Don't use your license. Don't do things just because you can. Consider those that come behind you. Parents, I would caution you. Be careful what you involve yourselves in. You can say, well, ain't no preacher going to tell me I can't. I'm not, I'll do what I want to do. I'm allowed to do what I want to do. Okay, but I'm going to remind you, you have little children coming behind you. I want to remind you that what you do in little bits, they may do in excess, and will you be happy with that? Will you be okay with that? Now look, sometimes when you're preaching in this generation, you've got to take the medicine and put it in peanut butter and put it in cheese. That's how I give it to my dog, you know, but I ain't putting no peanut butter, no cheese. There's a lot of things that in our society now we tap dance around that create a lot of problems for people. We ought to just hit it straight on and we ought to just say whether it's right, whether it's wrong, whether it's under the law or out of the law, regardless, does it help or does it hurt people? Does alcohol help or hurt people? Do drugs help or hurt people? Gambling, does it help or hurt? Does it make us have a better society? Are we better for it? These things that we bring in, and we say, well, just in a little bit, in moderation, all right. Well, you look at the one person that doesn't handle it in moderation, and you ask them if it was worth your little bit of moderation in your life. You find out then. See, I determined a long time ago that just because I'm allowed to do something doesn't mean I'm going to do it. I want to know if it's helpful, if it's hurting, if it's hurtful. 
There are things as a pastor that I say, you know what, I don't think it would be a problem in the world for somebody else. I don't think it would be sinful. I don't know that it's the best thing, but I, I don't think it's the problem. But I, it's probably better for me not to do that. Probably better for me not to go there. Probably better for me not to be involved in that. Why? I don't want it to become a stumbling block. There were folks who were offended by others. They were the weaker ones. They were, they were people eating meat that had been offered to idols, and that bothered particular believers. And there were other folks who recognized it's not, the idol's not real, and meat being offered to it doesn't change a thing about it. Give me the steak, man. But for fear of an offense to a weaker brother, they would say, and the Apostle Paul said, I will eat no meat if that causes offense to other people. You see, there's two things that we're directed by in this. Boy, I did Welcome back, preacher. <laughs> hey, welcome back home. There's two things we're governed by. One, to love God and to love others. And sometimes when you love others, you say, I'm not going to do that because I love others too much to do that. I wouldn't do that because that would be hurting another. Those are the two greatest laws, loving him and loving others. I don't want to be a stumbling block. Let me say this too very quickly here. I don't want to be a roadblock. I don't want to hinder somebody. I don't want to cause somebody to stumble, trip, fall, and, 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 and whether it be by teaching, by action, by appetite, by affection. I don't want to be a roadblock. I don't want to get in the way. There was a man who was sent by Abraham to go and claim a, a bride for his son, and he went and he met with these folks, and they had agreed on things, and he said, I'm ready to go back to my master. I've done what I'm supposed to do. And they tried to hold him on to him for a few days. And this is what he said in verse 56 of Genesis chapter 24. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. I hear it in the voice of Jesus too in his life when he says, I must work the works of him that sent me. Don't hinder. Don't be a roadblock. Listen, ladies, if your husband wants to serve the Lord, fellas, if your wife wants to serve the Lord, do all you can in that. Encourage that. If maybe they're growing and they're going right now and you're not, please, friend, be gracious in that. Love them and help them and be supportive in that. Be good to each other in that matter. I learned this early on in ministry. There was a young man, a young adult, who was troubled in life. And his family, I were involved in a ministry that I was a leader of. And the family said, would you work with him? Would you help him? And I said, absolutely, I'll do what I can. And so I befriended him. I began to work with him. I began to disciple him, spend time in the Word with him and pray with him. Got him involved in stuff, showed him how to live his life a different way, different purpose in life. And then one day I went by to pick him up and his family said, he's not coming today. I said, why? Did something happen? Well, we just feel like he's getting a little too carried away. A little too carried away. I said, well, hold on a second. You asked me to help him get carried. You said you wanted me. What are we doing here? We're just going to take a break for a while. You know that guy? Just a sweet guy. You know, he's in the exact same spot now after 30 years that he was when I left. And every time I go back to an area and I see him in our paths cross, the same thing. He had a family that was a roadblock to him. Hey, parents, if you have children that want to serve the Lord and do right, encourage them in that. Don't be a stumbling block. Don't be a roadblock. And I've got to hasten. Number three, let's be building blocks. Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the chief cornerstone. You can build on Jesus. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And who is the rock? The rock is Jesus and the teachings of Christ. And when the rains came down and the floods came up, that house stood what? Firm. Be a building block. I want my testimony, and I've got verses in Scripture, and I'm, for lack of time here, we'll just leave it at this. I want my life to be such where, like Jesus, and I'm not suggesting that I'm the cornerstone. I'm simply suggesting that as we are Christ-like, as our lives are Christ-like, as our patterns of behavior are Christ-like, as we're consistent in that, as the Apostle Paul said to those that followed him, follow me even as I follow Christ. I want people to be able to see in my testimony and our testimony something they can build on. Husbands loving wives, wives loving husbands, husbands, children being brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, honesty in our work, kindness in our communication, our vocabulary being pleasing to the Lord, our homes and the structure of things, our business, how we live our lives. But may they be buildable. May they be building blocks. And may all the relationships that we have in our church, may they be building relationships. Well, I don't want to cause people to stumble. 
I don't want to hinder people. You get together with folks and you begin to talk and you begin to communicate. May your communication be right. May it be Christ-centered. May it be helpful. May it be edifying. May it be exhorting. Don't let it be destructive or tearing down. Don't let it be foolish talk. Let it be good talk. Let it be purposeful talk. Help, help somebody. Show them what you've learned in the Scripture. Share with them the Word of God. Make it good. When you go soul winning with somebody, have opportunity to invite somebody to ministry. Invite them in. Let it be a good experience. Let it be a building experience. Uh, and by the word, that's what edify speaks of. Building. Be a building block. Be encouraging to people. Hey, hey, see the fallen brother and don't kick him in the face. Help him up. Help him. You see somebody in need. Help. Don't be a bump on a log. Be a building block that God can use. And be engaged. Be involved. Be encouraging. Be helping. The Galatians were asked, and the statement was made to them, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? I don't ever want to be that who. I don't want to be that stumbling block. I don't want to be that roadblock. I don't want to be that who that hindered another. I want the Lord to be able to look at my life and my involvement with God's people and it be one that can be built on. May I ask you a question this morning as I opened up with, what kind of block are you? Stumbling? Road? Or building? I suppose in our lives at various times, maybe we've been different types of blocks. And I'm thankful that there's mercy with God, aren't you? I'm thankful today that we have opportunity, a new mercy. Well, maybe we purpose today that from henceforth, I want to be a block that the Lord can use to build others and help others and further his work. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the word of God and the instruction in the word. Lord, I desire today for my life and the lives of those here, Lord, that we would be those blocks that could be used to build and your work could be furthered. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We've emphasized the topic of salvation today. For by grace are you saved. Are you here this morning and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Has there been a time in your life where you, by faith, received him? You recognize you were a sinner under the condemnation of God. Recognize that only God could save you, and he did so by sending Jesus Christ to die on your behalf. Have you placed your faith and trust in Christ? Have you confessed that? Lord, I believe that. You did that for me. I believe that. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Please pray for me. I don't know that I have that life in Christ that you spoke of at the beginning of the service. Pastor, please pray for me. I do not know that I'm saved. Would you raise your hand that I might pray for you? Who would say that today? Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved today. Would you lift your hand and I might pray with you? Who would say this morning, Preacher, I'm saved by grace. And I realize that I've been saved under good works and I want my life to be a building block life. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I don't want to be a roadblock. I want to be a building block. Help me, Lord. If you'd say, Preacher, that's my heart's desire. I want to be a building block for the Lord. Would you lift your hand with me? Father, you know our hearts and you see our hands. Lord, help us in those times in our lives, in our areas of life where we've not. Lord, help us to recognize it and see it. Lord, help us to pursue you as we go forward in this. Here in just a moment, we'll have an invitation. We have folks that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ who are going to follow the Lord and believers' baptism today. We encourage you, if you've been saved and not yet follow the Lord and believers' baptism, that you would do that. If you're here this morning and there's a need in your life, perhaps you're praying for somebody or simply the Lord dealing with your heart through the message today, However the Lord would have you to respond, I trust that you will. Let's stand to our feet, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. We'll ask the penis to play as she plays. The altar is open to you. You come now as the Lord would have you to.